who is the victim of this terrible thing? Who is the scapegoat of this horrific thing? An innocent man has been ruthlessly killed. An innocent man has been senselessly sacrificed. For whom has this man been sacrificed? For whom has this man been slain as an offering? For a guilty man has been hung on a cross. For a guilty woman he has been pierced. What kind of man is this who would die in the place of the guilty? What kind of man is this who would suffer for one who has done evil? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my Christ, would die for me? Friends, we unite our hearts in prayer. Eternal God, we ask you to have mercy upon us today. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to hear our prayers, to hear our petitions. We acknowledge you as our Heavenly Father. We acknowledge you, dear God, as the Alpha and Omega of all things. Today, dear God, as we assemble together within the walls of your sanctuary, as we come together as a family and a fellowship of believers, we look at this day, we look at the horrific ordeal that our Savior endured. And we acknowledge, Heavenly Father, that gift that you gave to us, placing your Son upon that cross, allowing him to become that sacrificial lamb, that suffering servant, so that each and every one of us could know that promise of eternal salvation. We ask you, dear God, just as we look upon the events that made us, Savior Jesus Christ to be that Lamb of God. We ask you to touch our lives in a very real way. We ask you, dear God, to transform our lives in a very profound manner so that all we do upon this earthly vineyard will allow others to see a true reflection of your likeness, of your grace, and of your beauty. We ask this prayer and all of God's people join together and say, Amen.
Pilate wanting to let him go, let him go free. But the crowd and the mob there, the same people who just the Sunday before had shouted, Hosanna, wave their palm branches, they now said, Crucify him, give us Barabbas. They demanded crucifixion. 8 a.m. Jesus, now squashed by the Roman soldiers in the courtyard and made to wear a crown of thorns, pressed and crushed into his skull. 9 a.m. The weakened Jesus, bruised, battered, and during hours of torture, now forced to carry his own cross to that point of crucifixion. And 12 noon, the momentous final three hours of him being on that cross. And then as they said, free again, the death of Jesus, recorded in all of us spells. Charles Spurgeon once said, it is fitting that every word of our Lord upon the cross should be gathered up and preserved. Friends, this is a Friday. You all know all the sermons you've been coming to church for a long time. You've heard the one about the penitent thief. You've heard about what to carry your own crosses. We've dealt with the sacrifice that Jesus made. Today I want to go and look at the events we just spoke about. The events of Good Friday as being a conversation with Jesus. Jesus having a conversation with you. Speaking to you personally. Speaking to the events of your life. Speaking to you and showing you what this day means and what it should mean to you if you are to pray eternal salvation. This is the Friday we are going to meditate upon the words of Christ. And we want to start off with the first conversation, the first phrase that he used that reminded us of forgiveness. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, we are told Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It speaks to us of forgiveness, the importance of forgiveness. The fact that Jesus, after being enduring all that he had endured, after being made a mockery by the same crowds that had welcomed him, he still had that within him, he still had that quality, that grace to say, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing, they are ignorant. And you know, forgiveness for us always starts with that first line of that popular hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. It reminds me of a Sunday school teacher who gave a long talk to the students about sin and the importance of forgiveness. When she finished the lesson, she looked at one of the little girls and said, Mary, what do we have to do before we ask the Lord for forgiveness? And little Mary confidently said, have to sin. Friends, it sounds coming on. It sounds like a joke, but amazingly, this is true because each and every one of us in our human weakness falls short of the glory of God every day in every way. All of us have been born in sin. But we are reminded that when we experience Christ's gracious forgiveness, we receive peace. To retain this peace, it is necessary to forgive others. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 to 15, we get that reminder. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men of what they have done, then your Father is not going to forgive you of your trespasses. When Jesus spoke his parables, there was one that he used to teach the people then about the perils and pitfalls of forgiveness. It was a story it was about the king who wanted to check his servants' accounts. And he realized that one of his servants owed him a large sum of money, about a year's wages. The king told the servant that he, his family, and all of his possessions were going to be sold. And obviously, the servant begged for mercy, and the king showed forgiveness of this debt. The same servant later found one of his fellow servants who owed him now a small amount of money on the day's wages. The servant that had been spared and forgiven, he looked at this other man and he said, you have to pay me in full before the end of the day. And even though the fellow servant now begged for mercy, the one who had been forgiven would not forgive the debt. When the king heard of this, he called his servant to him and said, 
said, I forgive you when you ask me. Should you not have done the same thing? Friends, this reminds us, and this is what Jesus demonstrated for us when he was placed upon that cross, when he was nailed to the cross, when he endured all of that suffering, he reminded us that this suffering tells us the good news of the gospel. Through his death, through his suffering, through all that he endured, we are forgiven. Why is it so difficult for us in our own lives to sometimes forgive something of someone that is so much more trivial? So the first conversation was forgiveness. The second one reminds us of salvation and hope. In Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 44, you all heard the reading of the two thieves on either side, and one of them looks at him and he says, If you are Christ, why don't you save yourself, and why don't we need save us as well? And the other thief rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? For we are guilty for what we have been placed here. This man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus looked at him, and this is the important part. This is where Jesus speaks to us. When we can acknowledge him for being the true Savior, he looks at us and he says, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It speaks to us of hope. The hope that he guarantees by sacrificing himself for us. We use that to sacrificial love. Do we understand that when he did that, it was to give each and every one of us that sense of hope. To remove the hopelessness and give us hopefulness. Recently, I was looking at a special, and they were dealing with convicts who became preachers. And one of them they focused on was a gentleman by the name of Victor. Victor was a drug dealer in Central Asia. He loved what he did. He loved that crime because it afforded him a lot of money. It gave him adventure. He got what they call an adrenaline boost. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Victor was caught and placed in jail. Spending time incarcerated, his mental state started to deteriorate and he started to become suicidal. And that was when God got hold of Victor. Victor's cellmate lent him a New Testament that he had received as a gift. And he invited Victor to read it. And because of suffering with insomnia, being unable to sleep, Victor did try to read the Bible. But he found it to be very confusing. The words didn't seem to make sense. Just as for many of us when we take it up sometimes. Nights after nights, he put down the Bible and then one night he decided he was going to try to read it again. And this time he felt God moving within him. He felt God speaking to him about eternal life. Victor became, became a changed man. So changed that when some fellow inmates offered him smuggled drugs, he didn't indulge. He refused it. But being saved doesn't mean the end of troubles. Right after that, right after telling himself he had given his life to his Lord and Savior now, he was diagnosed with having a terminal illness, being given a year to live. That news should have crushed him or depressed him. But instead, he confused his fellow inmates by the joy that he exuded because he was confident in his newfound relationship with Jesus. Victor had no fear of death. He knew it led to heaven. So instead of despair, he found hope. To everyone's amazement, he didn't die. In fact, he thrived. And Victor started preaching to the other inmates. He even established a church within the jail. When he was released, he decided to make his transformation official from drug dealer to preacher. He went to Bible school, he went to seminary, and became a qualified priest. To this day, Victor lives in his hometown in Central Asia, one of the towns that has been, has been classed as being number one on the world watch list of being dangerous to be a Christian. He continues preaching, he continues missionary work, he continues trying to bring others to our Lord and Savior. And why do we say this? So many times we look at the sad events of Good Friday, but we don't realize the hope that Jesus offered to each and every one of us if we 
will accept him as our Savior. Friends, Jesus being on that cross, being placed there on Good Friday, it tells us that if you are praying for the salvation of a family member, a loved one, or for yourself, Jesus tells us never give up hope, for salvation is attainable, and each and every person can find paradise. The third conversation has to deal with family relationships. John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27 tells us when Jesus looked down from the cross and he saw his mother standing next to the disciple that he loved, he said, Woman, he is your son. And then he said to the disciple, She is your mother. Imagine that. Torture, beaten, bleeding out to the point that he almost didn't have any more blood. The thorns crushing his skull. Flogged with the cat of nine. And Jesus at that time to recognize the importance of family members. The importance of family relationships. You see, so many times our society reminds us of the breakdown and degradation of the family unit. So many times people make a mockery of this important institution. We exist in a time where the seemingly best church was return to their homes and oftentimes do not communicate, care, show concern or even comfort members of their own family living within the same home. But the Bible is full of stories about family and the love of family and the need for family. It teaches us about the importance of loving and respecting our family members and the importance in their lives. From the cross, Jesus speaks to us about this. From the cross, he has that conversation with us. Regardless of his physical agony, regardless of the suffering, the mental and emotional anguish, he ensures at that point that his mother is provided for, that his mother is taken care of. Friends, the other conversation has to do with substitution. In Matthew 27, verse 46, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here was the Son of God, both human and divine, asking God, Why have you forsaken me? So often in our daily lives, we bounce our toe on a piece of furniture, we knock our shin, we bounce our elbows. And the first thing we do is fall out of God, as if the world is ending. The unimaginable torment, the unprecedented suffering, the relentless torture inflicted upon this innocent man became too much for his earthly body. And he looked to the heavens and he asked his heavenly father, why have you forsaken me? Just as so many of us say sometimes, when we need you the most, why aren't you there? And that line speaks to us of substitution. Friends, on the cross, on that Good Friday, Jesus became our substitute. He took our sins upon him so that we could all have that gift of righteousness. So that we could all seek that promise of eternal salvation. At that point on the cross, it embellishes in our minds and our hearts the omnipresence of God, that God is present in all places at all times with us. Because God ignored His Son at that point, allowing Him to suffer, letting Him go through all of that ritual that had been prophesied for so long. But it tells us by substituting for Jesus, for each and every one of us, that God will never leave or forsake us. So many times I remind you in your life, when you think you see one pair of footprints, that is when our Savior has placed you upon his shoulders. The fifth conversation speaks to us about humanity and suffering. In John 19, 28 and 29, it says Jesus knew that everything was now finished, and to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I thirst. Friends, the humanity of Christ to the reality that in his incarnation, the Son of God assumed a complete human nature. 
Syria with all of its limitations, but without surrendering its divinity. And this was so that he might serve as our representative, as our substitute, as our example. Because God became a man in the person of Jesus. He got hungry. He became exhausted. He became thirsty. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, emphasizes that conversation with us about humanity. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace, so that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. The conversations are almost ending. The sixth conversation, victory and grace. In John 19, 29 to 30, they place the sour wine on a sponge, and they put it on his up, and they put it in his mouth. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And that shows us the grace of God. When Jesus said it is finished, he had paid the price for our salvation. We have access to heaven. We can gain entrance into the early gates only because Jesus had taken punishment for our loss. It is finished. The debt was now to the last penny totally paid. Friends, Charles Spurgeon said it best when he said, There was the cup, hell was in it, the Savior drank it, not a sip and then a pause, not a draught and then stopping. He drained that cup till there were no dregs left for any of his people. And the seventh phrase, the seventh conversation, reminds us of the confidence we should have. In Luke 23, 46 to 48, when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath, so that when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Confidence that we should have when we accept Savior. Confidence in our Lord and Savior being placed upon that cross. I always use an anecdote to emphasize this. A very short one about the father and son driving through the countryside and they put the glass down in the car. They want the fresh air. And a bee flies into the car and a little boy being definitely allergic to these things. He starts to scream and cry. He becomes traumatized. And the father of all in love reaches out grabs the bee in the palm of his hand. The little boy calms down immediately. He felt he was that comfort in the act that his father has done. And then the father opens the palm of his hand once more and the bee begins flying around. The little boy becomes terrified, he becomes scared again. And then the father touches him on his shoulder and shows him the sting of the bee lodged in the palm of his hand. In that act, the Father says, you do not have any need to be scared. There's no need to be frightened. You do not need to panic. I have taken that sting for you. There is no threat to you. And friends, that is what God says by placing Jesus upon that cross. I have already taken that sting for you. You do not have the need to be afraid of anything. You do not have to be scared of even death. For I have taken that pain for you. Death, oh death, where is your sting? Friends, God tells us on Good Friday. God tells us by sacrificing His Son, by having that conversation with us, that pain, guilt, and death cannot touch us. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. In John chapter 15, verse 13, there's the line that we know so well. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, being placed on that cross, enduring all the hours of torture that he did, the significance of the Friday comes to us in the conversations we have had. The death of Jesus, dying on that cross, symbolizing for us that to believe on the Lord Jesus 
Christ and we are all saved. Does the Friday have that meaning for you? Believing in a Savior, a living and loving Savior, and achieving your redemption. Thanks be to God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.